of murder, second count of murder, possession of a firearm without a firearm ID card, malicious destruction of property not to exceed $1,200, negligent operation of a motor vehicle lies the general public or endangered, and you also have a six count of leaving the scene after causing property damage. On all six counts, not guilty, please be entered. Do you understand those charges, Mr. Lopes? Yes, I do. The court is appointing Mr. Tipton to represent you on this case. Mr. Tipton, remind me at the end on these other cases whether you want to accept the appointment on those. I would accept the appointment. Okay. So you'll take the appointment on all three cases? Yes, I will. Mr. Tipton, is there a question as to competency? I know Dr. Petru was interviewed. Is there a question? There is on behalf of the defense. All right. And we did conduct an interview. All right. Dr. Petru, could you step up, please, sir? Doctor, you raise your right hand for me, sir. Do you solemnly swear the evidence about to give this court as truth, the whole truth, help you out? I do. Yes, doctor. Your Honor, Mr. Lopes is a 20-year-old man. At first, with his attorney present, I administered the lamb warning. He seemed to understand all the elements of that. I went through two or three elements and then would ask for his understanding. The only one where he struggled a little bit was at the end when I told him about my responsibilities as a mandated reporter. He then talked about his perceptions of his own abuse growing up instead of that I would have to report if he had engaged in any kind of child abuse or elder abuse. He was coherent throughout the interview. The conditions for him, I think, were difficult, but he was coherent. He was able to describe events in a sequential fashion. He occasionally had to correct his memory. There was no indication of him hallucinating. There wasn't any evidence of any delusions. He denied experiencing any of those recently or in the distant past. He does have a distant history of psychiatric admissions, I think primarily as a juvenile. He indicated that he cut his neck seriously around age 15. That led to one of his psychiatric admissions. He indicated that he disagreed with the charges, but he understood them. He understood that they're serious. He suggested that he could receive two life sentences. He gave a reasonable account of plea bargaining. He gave reasonable accounts of the role of district attorney. He couldn't name his attorney by name initially, but he was familiar with his attorney from today and perhaps yesterday. He said he trusted his attorney. He would strongly consider his attorney's advice. In short, I didn't find any substantial reasons to doubt his competency, although I did tell his attorney that that would be my opinion. I also would not think, given the circumstances, that further evaluation would be inappropriate. So for purposes of today's arraignment, I'll make a determination that he's competent to be arraigned. Yes, Your Honor. We'll hear from the Commonwealth, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The Commonwealth would ask you to pull the defendant without bail based on the charges, and if I may go into some of the facts surrounding this matter, Your Honor. Please. Thank you. Your Honor, on July 15th at approximately 7.30 a.m., the Weymouth Police Department received 911 calls concerning an erratic operator of an older model BMW driving on Main Street in the area of South Shore Hospital. Traffic cams confirm that this car was driving at excessive speeds, and it is observed having a single car accident, I'm sorry, having an accident with a stationary motor vehicle parked right by South Shore Hospital. The operator of the stationary vehicle said that the defendant exited his vehicle, came over and apologized, and then ran from the area on foot. This being the basis of leaving the scene of property damage, Your Honor, this initial accident. Also, that vehicle did not belong to the defendant, but we believe belonged to his girlfriend. Cameras show that the defendant then went towards the area of Burton Terrace in Weymouth, a nearby neighborhood from South Shore Hospital, and 
Weymouth police would dispatch the general area to try and find a suspect involved with this uh, erratic operation. One of those officers dispatched was Officer Michael Chesna, who went to Burton Terrace, and upon arrival, he saw the defendant throwing a stone through a window on Burton Terrace, approximately 60 Burton Terrace. Now, Your Honor, this is confirmed through an independent witness who was outside of his home at this time. Officer Chesna exited his vehicle, had his weapon outside of his holster, and the defendant was approximately 10 to 12 feet away from him when he threw a large stone, approximately half the size of, say, a, uh, a basketball or, or a soccer ball. Double-handed throw over his head, striking Officer Chesna in the head. Officer Chesna immediately fell to the ground and dropped his firearm. The defendant was then observed picking up that firearm and eventually firing several times at Officer Chesna's head and torso. This was confirmed also by a second officer who arrived on the scene to see this, Officer Sean Murphy, who, when he arrived, immediately tried to return fire even through his own cruiser. One of the rounds he fired from his weapon is believed to have hit the defendant in the foot. The defendant then began to flee the area through neighboring yards. Then Officer Murphy gave chase, going over fences. All of this chase took place within the neighborhood of like three or four lots, Your Honor. When the defendant got to 100 Tory Street, the backyard of 100 Tory Street, he had climbed over a fence, lost his shoe, and Vera Adams was standing, it's believed, by her window at the back of her house. The defendant still had Officer Chesney's firearm and fired three times at Miss Adams. It was believed that she was struck at least twice. One of those being a, fight, a fatal wound to her. A third officer, an additional officer at this point, arrived on scene and were able to apprehend the defendant. Officer Chesney's firearm was found. It was completely empty of rounds. 13 shell cases were recovered from the area of Officer Chesney's body and his cruiser. Three rounds were located to be going through Miss um, Adams' home. Officer Chesney's firearm contained 16 rounds, Your Honor. Officer Chesney died of his injuries from, the, from those fatal gunshots, as did Miss Adams. The defendant was transported to South Shore Hospital. He remained in the custody of the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office during this time. A search shows that he did not have a firearm identification card, and that is the basis of him, uh, that charge, Your Honor, for he picked up a firearm that he did not have a license to carry and discharged it. The breaking of the window is the basis of the uh, property damage uh, under 250, Your Honor. And you've heard the facts that we allege on the homicides. The defendant's severity of his crimes, Your Honor, call for him to be held without bail. In addition, he has a significant flight risk where he is facing two life sentences, as it apparently he's acknowledged in the competency evaluation. And in addition, Your Honor, these facts alone indicate flight. For when, after he shoots Officer Chesna, he still flees from the area. So with this, Your Honor, the Commonwealth would ask you to have the defendant held without bail on this docket. That's essentially it, Your Honor. Judge, with regards to bail, I uh, will just ask whatever you set determined to be made without prejudice, but I would like to address the competency issue, please. I understand Your Honor found a, made a finding of competency for arraignment. In this state, an incompetent defendant can be arraigned. Uh, so, having said that, what I'm concerned about and why I'm asking that he be sent to Bridgewater for further evaluation for the 20-day evaluation is because the third prong of competency, ability to assist his counsel with his defense, I've been unable to speak with him in any coherent fashion regarding anything about the case. He has a long and detailed history of psychiatric disorders. He has a history of a reporting at least one time hallucinations. Right now, a case like this where the tragedy is so great that I would ask that we be very careful as the SJC is often instructed and ensure that the person that I'm having to deal with and the court's having to deal with and the prosecution is prosecuting is indeed competent. And under Chapter 123, if he is sent to Bridgewater for further evaluation, they can determine in, in quick stead if they would decide that he is indeed competent. Now, as the clinician told you, 
the, the situation, the environment for this evaluation today was outside in a van idle with enormous noise everywhere, including helicopters. Must have been 90 or 95 degrees because we were standing in the exhaust fumes. It was hard to hear, it was hard to think, and given all of those circumstances, I would ask that he be sent to Bridgewater for further evaluation. Thank you. Um, what I think would be most appropriate at this point, Mr. Tipton, is um, I'm happy to, I, I, I don't find based on the Dr. Petru's uh, evaluation report to me, I don't find a question of competency that would warrant me sending him to Bridgewater today. I'm happy to uh, approve whatever funds you need to have an independent evaluation done as to competency and anything else that you'd like to have evaluated for. Uh, but I don't think it's, uh, uh, based on what I've heard today, I don't think uh, uh, a Bridgewater evaluation is warranted as I've indicated. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Lopes, would be held without bail uh, and held at the uh, Dedham House of Correction. Could we get a, uh, uh, what date would you like? We, we do these normally on uh, Wednesday or Friday by a video conference for the first time out. And uh, I guess I'd ask whether you want it marked for probable cause or what you want it marked, Mr. Tipton. I think reality tells me that uh, it will undoubtedly be uh, indicted, so I'd ask for a 30 day date. And that would be the uh, Wednesday, I believe, the, uh, I want to say the 15th. All right, and how do you want it marked? For probable cause or for status? Yes, for probable cause. Yes, okay. Ron. Right. If you give us bail numbers, please. So, Mr. Lopes, you're held without bail until August, what was 15th, it, 15th at 9 o'clock for probable cause. You understand that, Mr. Lopes? Now, if you get arrested or charged with any new offense while this case is pending, you could be held without bail for up to 90 days. You understand that warning? Mr. Lopes? Thank you. And did you mark that by way of video? I did. And, uh, Your Honor, the other two cases Mr. Tipton will put on, we're going to change the date from June 30th to this date. Understood. Thank you. Um, could I ask everyone, please, to just remain where you are when the defendant is taken out of prison? Thank you. You've been watching the arraignment of 20 year old Emmanuel Lopes accused of killing Officer Michael Chesna and Weymouth resident Vera Adams. As you see there, the rows were filled with Weymouth, Weymouth police officers. The judge here found him competent to be held without bail. He'll be held at Dedham House of Correction for 30 days as this case goes on. We'll send you back to regular programming now. We'll have updates on this case on CBSBoston.com and of course the very latest on WBZ News beginning at 5 o'clock. We'll see you then.